Welcome back to Impostrix Podcast. I'm here with Tanya, who is a fellow podcaster. You actually have heard her voice before because during my off season between seasons one and two, I aired a crossover episode where Tanya hosted me on her podcast, Tea with Tanya, and we talked about imposter syndrome. I'm really happy to have Tanya on the podcast finally to talk about um, women's health, women's health issues, and how we navigate those as working people, as professionals, because it can be so difficult for us to have boundaries. Well, for me, I'll speak for myself, (laughs) to have boundaries um, with work and the other things going on in my life and prioritize my health. So Tanya, welcome. Can you introduce yourself? Give us your um, name, of course, and what you do and your podcast stuff. Give us give us all the the information. Oh, you put me on the spot now, honey. Um, First of all, let me say I am so happy to be here in the Impostrix room. It's been, I want to say, one of my goals. So when you ask, oh, she finally thought of me, you know, but it's happy to be here. I'm happy to be here. (laughs) I'm a person that I do the most. I'm Tanya and do the most Ambrose at this point in time. But I am a fellow podcaster. I'm the host of the Tea with Tanya podcast. I'm also the founder and CEO of the nonprofit organization Squad Life Cares, where we work towards removing the stigma surrounding menstrual period poverty and providing education as it relates to reproductive health as well. And I'm also a public health professional working in the maternal and child health sector. I'm also a birth and postpartum doula, a certified lactation counselor. I'm I'm just doing the most. I do the most, but all for a good reason, because I am very passionate about women's health. And I think this current season of my life, I'm working towards being intentional as it relates to my health and wellness, because I was of the mind that, you know, I'm from the Caribbean and we, we have a much more healthier lifestyle there. And, you know, I'm this slim person. I can't really say the same right now because I am not that slim anymore. But <laughs> yes, trust me, if you see me like five years ago, like, oh, my goodness, we need to eat. But nevertheless, you know, I just decided after having some complications, like, you know, chronic migraines and other things, I decided to be very intentional about my health and wellness journey. And that's what I share on the podcast and just share in my everyday life because it's it's very important, especially as a black woman in the United States as a black immigrant woman as well, it's very important that I learn or know how to advocate for myself or just be more in tune with my body because the society that we're living in right now, whoo, child, is rough. Mm. It's a rough, rough, rough society, you know? So um, definitely got to make sure we're educated. And so, because I always say an educated individual will always be empowered. So, Mm. so that's key. But yeah, so that's me. Tanya doing the most, you know, but I love it. All in all for good reason. All about community. Yeah. And you're Antiguan? Antiguan, not the one. I was just, <laughs> it's funny you said that. I was just having a discussion with a friend last night. Because I guess people want to argue about the Guan. It's like, oh, it came from a Spanish word. I say, I'm telling you, it's Antigua. We have never said Antigua before. So I am an Antiguan. <laughs> I know it spells the G-U-A. It may probably give it away for it to be Gua, but it's literally just Antigua, you know? So putting that disclaimer <laughs> out there. Thank you for correcting me. Antigua. So Antiguan. Antiguan. Uh, Antigua. Okay. All right. Okay. Just ignore the U altogether. Yes. Antigua. <laughs> and you have an event coming up, right? In Antigua. Yes. It's our um, third annual Grow the Flow Women and Health Women's and Health Expo. Well, women's and women and girls health expo because we do cater to individuals from ages eight and up. But we realize that we've had parents and even siblings bring their ba- their baby sisters or brothers like from five and up. So this year we're gearing up to ensure that we're catering to every age group because it's just a good it feels good to get back to the community because i always say when i first migrated here to the u.s which is about to be almost 15 years wow oh my goodness yes it's about to be 15 years since i've migrated to the united states and i always said when i moved here i wanted to give back to antigua in some way shape or form because i'm of the mind that how i was raised and where i was raised prepared me to be able to survive in many different cultures for some reason that's that's all my belief so i thought i had to be a millionaire not quite there yet with me but i'm, I'm on the way I'm, I'm working to it towards it but i thought i had to be a millionaire in order for me to get back to my country and you know it turns out i didn't have to i'm still trying to be there you know gotta get that coin up but mm-hmm. my goal is was always you know growing up seeing my parents especially my mom give back to people in the community so it just feels good to give back to Antigua, but specifically the village that I was raised in, in Antigua. So that's where we have the event on um, Grow the Flow. And you guys can donate, and I'm sure we'll put that in the show notes if you want to 
support our organization by buying menstrual hygiene products, definitely check our website out and, you know, give back. You mentioned something when you were talking about um, the event that's coming up, which is that the event was initially for people eight years and up, but people are bringing their little siblings, relatives, whoever, starting at age five. And this just reminds me of a conversation I had recently with my dermatologist and the PA who was in the room. And I was complaining about all my body aches at 36 years old. And I was telling the doctor who was probably my mother's age, I was like, you know what? I don't think y'all adequately prepared us for like what's happening with our (laughs) bodies. Like I didn't think that my body was gonna start hurting and different things were gonna start changing in my body until I was quote middle aged. And here I am 36 years old, me and all my friends are constantly texting each other Uh about whatever is happening with our bodies today. And I just am like the generation before us, like did you, did your mom, did your, did you have women in your life who were talking to you about like specifically 30s, early 40s, like pre-menopause? No. Not at all. And I remember, I didn't think, I don't think I had the conversation about even peers with my mom. I just remember one year we were on vacation in, in New Jersey visiting one of our um, family members. And me being me, I'm very nosy people. If you're listening, Tanya, I like to say I'm a research queen, but I'm very nosy. And my ear is always cocked to the side <laughs> when it has no business to. And I just remember overhearing my aunt and my mom talking. And my aunt asked my mom, you know, have you spoken to her about her period or did she get her period yet? And she's like, no. And then my mom told her, I got mine when I was at a 12 or 30. My aunt was saying the same thing. So I, I just knew, again, that it was something that was going to happen. And it's what a coincidence that that same year, I think, when I went home, because my mom was away having my youngest sister. And I went home and it happened. And I was like, okay, who am I going to um I mean, like, again, I knew what I had to do. So instead of going to my grandmother at the time, I went to my older cousin at the time because I'm on. She has a period, and her and I were really close. So I, I remember telling her, and she's like, "Okay, this is what you're gonna do. So you put your pad on." And then I went to the store to go get some extra because we didn't have any. And I never told my grandmother anything for that first, <laughs> that first menstrual cycle at all. Yeah. And then one day, because like I said, my mom was still away with, with my sister. And the next month, when it came around again, and this is why I tell people all the time, I have period trauma. It's also why I'm so passionate about period poverty and just menstruation as a, as a whole because didn't tell my grandmother and had an accident at school, an accident. Mm. Luckily, luckily for me, I went to an August school. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, an August high school, and I remember we, we had this rule in, in high school that whenever we were sitting down, whenever a teacher entered the classroom, we had to stand up. I, I don't know why, but I guess you know, it's all a part of the discipline, I guess, you know? Yeah. And I remember standing up, and my friend who was sitting behind me, she's like, girl, you know, you're on your period X, Y, Z. Anyway, they took me to the bathroom and washed my uniform out and whatnot. But apparently, once it dried, I still had a little bit of a stain of the blood on the back of my uniform. So when I got home from to my grandma's house and then, you know, took the uniform off, put it in the dirty hamper and everything, she saw it. She's like, girl, why you didn't tell me? And then she, you know, did her variation of the, the talk, yeah, you know? Yeah. But I just never had that conversation. It's just, it was not something that we had then growing up with all sisters, you know, I'm, an, I'm also an older sister and I remember. Wow. Yeah. I have an older sister and I'm you know, the other oldest, but uh, I remember them having their periods and me and my cousin, we just, we found this book randomly. I don't know where we found a book about periods and my cousin brought it over to, to my sister and we just had that conversation. So we were essentially the advocates for them or the educators as it relates to periods based on our knowledge, because again, we didn't really have that conversation with our, with our mom. Because to be honest, in, in my culture and also the Caribbean culture, sometimes, you know, you get a period, the first thing they think about is don't get, don't have sex or don't get pregnant. Nothing mm-hmm. else. So we're not thinking about maybe the abnormalities such as, you know, extreme cramping or excess bleeding or heavy bleeding, these different things. We're not, we weren't told about that. We were just told about don't be fast, don't have sex. Cause if, once you see a period, you know, it's time to get pregnant. That's, yeah. That's what they, the, the thinking is around that. And even to, to this day, to some extent, it's still that way. You know, that's why, again, for me, I'm trying to break the stigma, the stigma and even other organizations in the Caribbean about let's just talk about period is more to it than just sex because for me, I had friends who had really bad periods um, with me. When I say bad, like they would vomit. It, it was just bad. Wow. But we just thought that for some reason, I don't know why, but we just thought it was normal. We just didn't know what this person, okay, it's, it's, time, it's time of the month. They just they're going to get sick. They're going to miss school or they're going to just be thrown up at school. And we just, we just honestly thought it was normal. And that same friend t- turns out today now she has endometriosis. 
and another one has mm. PCOS. So again, we are missing these marks or these cues because again, for some reason in society, as a woman, you know, you ate the forbidden fruit, so you you we deserve the the, yep. the types of pain or treatment that we get in society, and it's just it's a messed up way in which and how we think. But I mean, what can we do? Like you say, you know, you're talking to your friends about different things that you probably should have known. When you were younger, even me, like I tell people, even though I'm still doing this work, I learn something every single day. When I'm doing some sort of research, you just, you know, individuals mm. are having periods earlier and earlier now. And parents are just not open or ready to have that conversation. So with, with our event and the organization as a whole, we serve as that bridge to like try to educate parents. So let them know, you know what, this is a waste, a normal cycle of life. Let's just not try to force sex upon our 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 menstruators but also if we are going to mention or talk about sex of course we want to make sure that it's talked about in a age-appropriate manner because we, mm -hmm. we do it we did we didn't scrub life case and our event back home because we cannot shy away again from the culture we cannot shy away from sex is why we you know we're fighting for comprehensive sexual education in our schools because again we're just told you get a period put on a tampon, do whatever, don't have sex, don't get pregnant, or go and break control because oh, I don't want to deal with you being a teen mom or getting pregnant, you know, during your, too, too much, I guess, as younger than, you know, your mom when she had, when she first had you. And it's like, okay, we can, I get that. But also, again, if we provide the education, we can be better informed so that we can make decisions that are best for us. And I think that's what we lack in just across our boards with, with um, the healthcare industry or just in general. When we lack information or education, we, we just don't know. And we, we're making decisions that maybe not be as informed or telling us what social media tell us to do. Oh, I saw this on TikTok. That's a big thing. One of my friends was like, oh, I saw this on TikTok. And I'll say the same thing too, because you know what? It's a part of our lives. Yeah. But I think for me, sometimes I don't want to be the Debbie Donner. Like, oh, you know what? That's not accurate because I find myself being that way. I'm like, you know what? You know, social media can be fun too. But when, when things are being taken out of proportion, I have to step in and be like, you know what? This is not accurate because... We are in a world where young people or people in general, they're just seeing things on social media. There's no fact checking. This person has X amount of followers. So whatever you say, I can be easily influenced by you. So it's I, like I have a love and hate relationship when it comes to social media as a healthcare professional, because it's just like, okay, and I get it. But at the same time, let me make sure it's evidence-based, you know? Yeah. I think till this day, it's still the case in you know, the community that I'm in, at least, that we don't talk about periods. And, and well, let me retract that. We don't talk about the entire cycle, both in terms of what the menstruation cycle is and what that, you know, what that makes up, but also in terms of our life cycle uh -huh. and what to expect with women's health you know, along the different ages. And so, so much of what my friends and I are talking about, like I said, is health. Everything from abnormal periods uh -huh. and menstruation to back aches and knee aches uh -huh. and I can't wear heels anymore because X, Y, Z and, you know, procedures that we're having to go through and, you know, now it's about time some of us are taking mammograms um, and starting to be screened for different kinds of cancers. Uh -huh. And, you know, all of this can be traumatizing Yeah, when we have no idea what to expect. Nobody has ever talked to us. Like, we literally didn't think that we had to deal with, quote, old people problems until we were, quote, old people. Yeah. And now we're realizing that we are. <laughs> like, there is no, there's no in the middle. For me, it felt like I was 22 and, like, all good. I was fit. I was, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I was 33. And oh, I feel right now because I am 33. And I was like, okay, the little weight that I'm putting on, I said, I know about, you know, when you age, you gain a little weight, but. I was not prepared still. I wasn't prepared for the change in hormones as I was leaving my 20s into my 30s or just the different things that come as we age. And again, yeah. that education, we just know, okay, by the time you get to maybe 40, 50, you can expect to go into beyond in menopause. I was like, okay, let's talk about pre-menopause or let's just talk about all this. And again, I don't think the education surrounding the lifespan is, is not there. We're just thrown to the wolves. Make sure you eat, make sure you drink your water, pay your bills, do whatever, and then that's it. 
And sometimes it's, it's not always the case. And I'll, I'll also say that I think because we're not talking about what happens, you know, at age 30 or at age 35, when we are having to go to uh-huh. the doctor to do these things, we're feeling like, oh, something's really wrong with me. Uh-huh. Like I'm on Google and my symptoms say I'm going to die. Yes. Like I don't necessarily want to tell anybody because I feel like I'm unique. Come to find out so mm-hmm. many other people are experiencing this exact same thing. And so what I'd love to talk to you about today as we're talking about women's health uh-huh. is how we can set boundaries for ourselves with um, work, but also with people in our lives to protect ourselves and give us that space to be Uh able to take the time that we need to go to the doctor if we need to go to the doctor, to take a mental health day if we need to take a mental health day, to work from home because our cramps are that bad that we don't feel like we can get out of bed or to, you know, I know by by this age, many of us, so early mid thirties, many Uh of us know what to expect from our bodies during, um, at I least during the time that we're menstruating. And uh-huh. so we know like we might have a whole set of clothes just for when we're <laughs> menstruating. Yes. That are, looser, that, is true. that are dark colored, that feel more comfortable. Um, but yeah, I'm interested to hear from you as far as setting these boundaries because it can be so difficult for us, one, to even just stop and like feel our bodies, uh-huh. yeah, like that part. be in our bodies to feel what's happening and to feel uh-huh. what we need. But then once we are doing that or we're forced to do that because we've been ignoring something, um, how do we go to our employers and to our colleagues and to our friends or family members and say, look, I just need a second. Like, I need a day. I think that's that question, I don't want to say it's a hard question, but for me, I, I'll give an example for me. Because I think, again, balancing life. We have to balance life, Whitney. We have to balance having, some of us have full-time jobs. In your case, you know, you have children. I don't. But at the same time, work can be a lot. And then as a woman, if you are a woman who you're pregnant, you have to go to your weekly appointments, depending on if you're high risk, low risk, or where you are in your in your pregnancy. You know, you may be someone who may have extreme periods that's, you know, like the extreme cramping. Like I mentioned earlier, a friend of mine who throws up every single period. Like these are things that we're dealing with. Some of us may have three to seven day periods. Some of us may end up having bleeding throughout the month. That, that's the thing too. Because again, you know, you're still trying to figure out your diagnosis. So as a woman, and then I think we don't talk about our mental health when it comes to our menstruation as well. Not only menstruation, but, you know, as a woman in general. And I think it's very challenging as a woman to find that work-life balance because again some employees or employers they may not understand especially you know i'm gonna say this if you're not if you're a man you know you don't understand what it is that we go through on a regular basis i often joke and said that as a woman we have one week one good week out of a month to be quote unquote normal and even then (laughs) it's it's not normal because our hormones are changing but i think a way we can advocate for ourselves as when it comes to our jobs is to I'll say be transparent, have that communication because mm-hmm. effective communication is key, especially when it comes to discussing any sort of head related issues that you as an employer may, or employee may be having. You know, if you're a person like me who's very sociable when it comes to my coworkers, because most of my coworkers, they are friends, you don't want to ensure that you have someone who can support you. Because for me, I, again, I'm big on community, I'm big on support. Again, today I could be happy, the next day I could be sad because life lives you know so i think we have to ensure that we're speaking up be clear be direct sometimes i say even be assertive because at the end of the day my thinking or my philosophy is if i were to get sick and have to be out for months if i were to get released from my job you're going to find someone else in my place rather quickly right so you want to ensure that if you have underlying health conditions as well you want to ensure that you're telling your employer or your manager your directors that okay you know what i'm coming into this job but i have a xyz chronic illness or chronic disease that I have to be out of the office once or twice a week, or I have to work from home. And, you know, if that's, if that's the case, a certain time of the week for me, let me tell, let me tell this with me. One thing about me, I used to be ashamed to talk about my chronic migraines because I'm like, you know what, again, I'm from the Caribbean, you know, you're supposed to be a strong black woman or you're supposed to be, you know, pushing through your pain or pushing through. Like I, I used to always live by, you know what, just push through. And then after you're done, you can, you can, you can rest. But I realized that my migraines, when they're here, because I have levels to my migraines, but when they're here, I'm done for the day. I'm, sometimes I'm even done 
for the week because of how severe my my migraine is. So I think, you know, I, I encourage listeners to look at your workplace policies as well because sometimes we think, you know, okay, yeah, we're women. They know I got periods. They know I'm pregnant. They know whatever. They're going to understand that it's not the case. It's important that you read the fine print. Read those workplace policies to ensure that they are your, your job is catering to your needs as a woman. If you're if you're someone who can have flexible work arrangement, like you said, Whitney, we have telecommuting. I'm going to be at home three days out of the week. I'll come to the office once or twice because you know what? that's what I can handle. And as far as a mental health day, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> one, thing, one thing about me, I'm going to have me a mental health day. And I don't know who's going to hear this podcast. I hope my managers are not listening. Sometimes my mental health day is not always going to be me being completely away from the job. I could be in the office or I could be at home, but I'm going to limit, I guess, how productive I am that day. And I'm just going to keep it real because sometimes, you know, of course, you, you know, your work is important. You don't want to just keep taking off. And in my case, I have to go home for my event. I have a lot of things that I do at my nonprofit where I have to fly out ever so often. My PTO is not always going to be enough for me to be doing, taking mental health days. So I use, I often like, you know, I tell my manager, I'm like, you know, today's a migraine day or today I'm just not feeling it. Like one time I had my director tell me, I was at work and she's like, oh, why you look so down? I said, I'm not in the mood to be here today. Literally what I said to her. And she was like, you, you're going to tell your director that? I said, you want me to lie to you? Because <laughs> sometimes they like to say that I'm too um, abrasive. But I'm like, well, do you want me to lie to you? I'm not going to be here acting like I want to be at work. Now, I'm not telling you to do this with your, you know who the relationship that you have with your managers or your directors. But that day, I just, I was having a bad day and I said, you know what, I don't want to be here. And she's like, you know what, well, you know what, you're telling me that? I said, yes, I don't want to lie to you. And she told me, you know what, it's okay, let's take the rest of the day. And she sent me home. So I guess, you know, again, being upfront, ensuring, know what your limitations are. Because I don't care how much I love my job, Whitney. And again, I know when my limit has been, has peaked. So it's time for me to tap out and do something else or just not do anything at all. So we have to really and truly think about reframing our mindset surrounding self-care. Because sometimes, I'm sure you can relate, we feel guilty for missing work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we feel guilty for not being as productive as we would have been on a Monday versus a Wednesday or even a Friday. Because for me, Fridays are my days where I'm just going to be... I'm just going to keep it real. I'm going to be slow. We should not work on a Friday or Monday either or. So since I got to work Monday to Friday... Friday is going to be my day when I'm just taking it at least a little bit easier than the other days in the week. Because I tend to go hard. I'm like, you know what, for me, I know what my limits are. So I'm just going to ensure that I communicate those needs when it comes to my my managers or even my direct coworkers. Because again, what I do can also impact their work significantly. So you want to ensure that you're having that conversation, setting that boundaries, know, know your limits, know how many hours in an eight to nine hour day or even 12, 15 hours that you can work again. So I think the biggest thing I can say is just to have effective communication, check your workplace policy so that you can have that conversation ahead of time before you get into the job or the position and then you're ex they have certain expectations of you and you're not able to meet them. And lean into your, um, lean into your flexibility. Again, if you're a nurse mm. listening this well, of course, you know, you may not have the option to not work a full 12 hour shift, but of course, lean into how flexible your job is. Because I think COVID taught us, taught us all that, you know, life is fickle. I mean, the society today is like life is fickle, but I think COVID really opened a lot of our eyes to see that we were really just going, 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 myself included. Like I was going to school full time in undergrad. I was working two jobs because I had this goal of, you know, I want to have a house. I want to do X, Y, Z. And I kept pushing through. Me, I kept pushing through my illness. I kept pushing through my migraines. I'm like, you know, it's just a headache because I'm stressed from work in school. Oh, I'm not getting enough sleep. Oh, I'm push I, I ignored my GI, my gastro mm -hmm. issues that I had because I'm like, you know what, again, I'm just stressed up from work. I'm not eating. I'm not taking care of myself. When in fact, again, I was just trying to live up to an expectation from my managers. And I wasn't advocating for myself. So I'm like, you know, I'm tapped out. So I think COVID taught us that one, those of us who are fortunate to have jobs where we can work from home some days and in the office, or even if you work remote, remotely full time, you still do need a break again from that. Yeah. You still need a mental health day. You still need a day to know what I'm having really bad cramps. I can't work today. And that should be okay. Because I know in, <laughs> in some places that you're telling your manager, oh, I'm having really bad cramps today. It's like, okay, take a pill and keep it moving. I've seen yeah. that. I've experienced that when I used to have like, you know, cramping, even if they, mine were mild, mine were mild, but still headaches and periods don't go well together. And I've had an individual, individual told me, oh, take two Midol. I said, well, you know, I can't take Midol because I'm allergic. Oh, take an ibuprofen. I can't take, and you know, they, they started thinking that I was lying, but it's like, again, so I just think we need to get to a point in 
time or place where we can understand that as a woman, as a menstruating woman, as a woman who's going through menopause, who's breastfeeding, who whatever your issue may be, I think our those who are leaders should, I guess, express more empathy. And that's not what we're getting in the workplace. We have to just show up, work and work and work and work because we got a quarter to meet. We have this deadline to meet, but then I'm burnt out and I can't perform. And then wh where does that leave me from a health standpoint, mental health? And then where does that leave me as an employee? Because you're going to say, you know what, we have to let you go because you've been absent too many times. When four weeks in a month, and of that four weeks, a week and a half, I'm just really messed up. So I think we have to get to yeah. a point where we promote that understanding that our lives are changing. Again, that goes back to our education and understanding the lifespan of where we are. Where we were when we were in our teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, we are not the same. We, we're evolving in a way that we're not the same individual at 25. I know I'm not, I know about you. I'm not the same person at, at 25 health-wise or even from a physical standpoint to where I am now at 33. So I think once we remove that stigma and really educate society as to what it is that we go through, then, you know, it'll make life better. Yeah. And we all know if, if you're a woman <laughs> or identify as a woman, uh -huh. like we know. And so I think the other thing and the reason why I love this platform of podcasts um, is that we can be thinking about like, we don't need somebody to prove to us that they're having really bad pain right? because most of us have experienced that mm -hmm. or really bad headaches or the combination of all of the things that are happening in our body mm -hmm. or that we're cranky today for whatever reason, or, you know, like some of what we are experiencing as people with uteruses uh, yeah. is pretty universal. Like we may have experienced this at some point in our life. We may have experienced back pain. And so your point about having more empathy, I think really extends not only to us as supervisors and bosses, but uh -huh. um, as we're thinking about ourselves and what we need moving forward. And so I also appreciate your reframe around mental health days because uh -huh. I take mental health days um, – <laughs> I think a lot of my friends, the people that I'm around take mental health days, but it's difficult for me to, if, if today is working, like if I chose to go to work today, mm -hmm. then today is not a mental health day. And so what mm -hmm. I appreciated about what you said was I may go to work, but I may have to adjust what my work day looks mm -hmm. like based on what is going on with my body, mm -hmm. whether that's mental health or whether that's physical health and, you know, aches or pains or whatever that might be. Because I certainly feel guilty on days where I'm not as productive. But the, for the most part, days where I'm not as productive are days where I'm not feeling well, mm -hmm. where I'm not, you know, I'm just not up for it. And yeah. so there's times when um, I – just can't get it going. And I spend much of that day feeling guilty or feeling shame. Uh -huh. Even I work for myself now and I still feel that way. No, I like <laughs> I don't have, right. I don't have a product that I have to show somebody. Yes. I work for myself. I set goals for myself. I work hard. And if I don't meet that goal, then I feel bad. And I want to make myself stay up late and work, you know, that night. Instead, I need to be flexible and adapt to what my body is feeling today. And um, really on the days where I do have a lot of energy, yeah. like maximize what I'm doing those days and on other days not. And so tomorrow, for example, I have scheduled as an administrative day. Uh -huh. So it's going to be a low energy day. Um, I'm still going to be exhausted because I'm going to be dealing with things like invoicing and money yeah. and business licensure and all of these things. But it's not a day where I'm going to be interacting, where I have to put on makeup, like I'm going to be in my pajamas <laughs> all day, you yeah. know, that type of thing. And you get you get to create that day because, again, you know, we say we feel guilty. It's, for me, getting to the place where I am right now, it took me – I'm just not. This is. I mean, this this isn't a new era for me because I'm an overachiever. <laughs> my therapist, I said I'm an overachiever. And I, again, that mindset – coming from the Caribbean, we, we often, you know, we have to work hard. We have to make sure that we are successful. And, you know, you just have this standard that you have to live up to and nothing is wrong with that, but you have to, as you get older and as you mature and you're realizing how life is, you have to adjust 
your your workload. For me, I work a full time job. I go to school full time in grad school. I have a non profit and I have a podcast. I'm a, I'm a doula. Again, doing the most, but again, all for good reason. But I have I got to a point where I was burnt out from being a founder from to my non profit. Like I was burnt out after our event last year, Whitney. I could not push myself to do anything. And that's not me because I call my nonprofit my baby, right? So I'm like, you know, I don't have any mm-hmm. kids, but that's my baby. I'm going to work in this X amount of hours a day all week. And I was burnt out, but I, I kept trying to push through. And again, the migraine started acting up, the, the GI issues and just my physical form was just like, you need to sit down. And I think that moment taught me, you know, that, you know when I go to work, I work from 8.30 to 5. So I'm, on a Monday, I'm a morning person. So I have no issues getting up early, doing that. But by midday, I'm tapped out for the day. So I, I'm having to reprogram or recalibrate my mind to obviously work through that. But it's okay. I don't want to say it's okay if we feel guilty, but understanding that as we become more in tune with our bodies, we know what we can handle. We should not be feeling mm-hmm. guilty when it comes to rest. I saw something earlier that said rest is productive. And I was like, hmm, how, you know, I've seen it before. I'm like, how is rest productive? But after having the experience, and you know what? Okay, I cannot record a podcast episode today because my man is not there. And I'm the kind of person that even to post something on Instagram, or social media as it relates to the podcast, if my energy behind that post is not 100%, the post is not going to perform well. I know it sounds crazy, but stay with me. If my energy, <laughs> <laughs> like, the same thing with an episode, if I'm, if I'm uploading if the energy when I'm actually clicking the audio to upload to my, my posting, my, my hosting website or whatever, if the energy behind that for me is not 100%, I have to like, you know, give it a break, come back until I get to that point because I, again, it could just be my mind, but I just, I, I feel like when I'm not giving myself a hundred percent to what I'm doing, I cannot be productive or I cannot be where I, as successful as I want to be. You know what I mean? So it's very important that you rest, recalibrate your mind and your body, and then you come back again. Cause it's going to still be there. The task is going to still be there no matter what. Yeah. Well, and I, I really want to touch on that point because I think it's really interesting I've not really approached tasks in that way. And Uh granted, there are some tasks that like we can't wait around for our energy to be right, you know. Right. But for things like podcasting or other hobbies or parts about our jobs that we actually like, Uh and um, if we are finding ourselves low energy or not energetic about that specific thing at that specific time, it really does make a lot of sense to me to just wait until we do have the energy because uh-huh. that can help us avoid um, burnout. But also, I don't know if resentment is the right word, but yeah. like. It, can, it is. The, right. Like sometimes the things that we like to do feel like a chore. Yes, that part. And it's definitely feeling like a chore if I'm not with it. Like if I'm just not in the space yes. of this thing, no matter how big, no matter how small, But if it's something that we know that we like doing and Mm -hmm. we have time to wait, then yeah, I'm going to try just waiting until Uh the energy is there. So what I've been doing, I've been getting some little sticky notes. You can get them in different colors if you want. And what I do, I write down four to five tasks on that sticky note. Like one is for my job. One is for nonprofit, one is for podcast, and one is just for my personal life, you know, what I'm going to eat today, what X, Y, Z. And I find that when I put these things on, on the sticky note, four or five, it doesn't have to be more than that, four, four to five, I put them in the order of my priority. And sometimes I may not even go with the top priority. I go with the one that's going to require less of my energy, less of my mm-hmm. thinking, whatever it is. So once I can scratch something off of that sticky note, I end up feeling good about myself. So it's like a self-motivating factor because you know what? Okay, I'm not having this big plan where I have to have X, Y, Z from 5 a.m. to midnight outlined. And we become overwhelmed. And then that's how we end up stressing ourselves at work and just in our, in our regular life. As a mom, get some sticky notes. Okay, I got to make lunch for my, for my baby. I got to make sure I have this for baseball or football practice because, you know, as, as a mom, I'm sure you have a lot of things, a lot of activities. <laughs> Mm-hmm. that you you have to do in the week and on the weekend. So I guess, again, giving ourselves grace, stop, I don't want to say stop me, trying to meet or set certain deadlines, but be flexible. It's all about being flexible again. We spoke about having flexibility at our jobs. We have to be flexible with ourselves as well. Because if we're not, then we're going to run ourselves down into the ground, a.k.a. me. Now I'm having to rebuild yeah. back my life and really being intentional about my health. Yeah, and I'll say this last thing that I'm going to ask you um, a final question. I recently, so I'll say that when I started working for myself, I thought that I would be working less. Oh, girl, no. 
Uh-uh. Yeah. Not at all the case. Somehow all my days are full. But they were becoming too full to the point of waking up every day. I was like stressed out for Fatigue. the things that I had. Yeah. So what I started doing was using one of those weekly planners where you can tear out the page when the, Ooh, the week okay. is done. I like that. Um, I got it literally two years ago and never used it. Um, but I am on Sunday nights writing down the key things uh-huh. for that week. Um, so that one, I can know what's in store for that week yeah. and whether or not I might need to move some stuff around or cancel some stuff based on, um, you know, how I think my energy is going to be uh-huh. or if I have enough breaks because I realized <laughs> my natural stamina for talking meetings or for, um, I don't know, working on curriculum. Like I have less stamina now than I did when I was working for other people and oh, wow. needing to talk to other people uh-huh. all day long. Now I can't do that. It takes a lot of energy for me. So I have to space out my day between uh-huh. a talking meeting and a non-talking work task. Um, so, but anyways, writing the week out for myself, uh-huh. like it's already in my Google calendar. Yeah. But then writing it down on a piece of paper and giving myself opportunity to adjust but it also lets me see and reflect on what's working and what's not working in terms of the amount of commitments and engagements that I'm giving myself every week or on a particular day. Um, and that's just been really helpful for me to write down the things, but also reflect back so that next week I don't have to schedule how I did the week yeah. prior or I can do certain thing. Like right now I'm doing somatic reflections on Monday mornings. Uh-huh. Um, and so really just keeping track of what's working, what's not working, what feels right for my body, what doesn't feel right for my body, uh-huh. what's going to make make me be like sitting all day long versus yeah. things where I can get up and walk around. Uh, and thinking about all of those types of things has been really helpful. Um, so I want to ask you, I actually have two two more questions. The first question is, um, for those of us who love people with uteruses, <laughs> um, what can we do and what can our role be in working with or supporting that person in advocating for their health needs? I think for me, and I, I come to, th- to this question as a doula, because I often say as a doula, you know, I am educating you about childbirth education, but my biggest thing is the support. So even though I'm your doula, I'm your part of your support system, we have to learn to navigate or have hard conversations. Again, communication is very key. I know it's, it's maybe sounding sound redundant, but we have to have to, women or people with uteruses, we have to communicate our needs to those who are part of our village or our support team, whether it's a partner, it's a friend, whatever it is, because at the end of the day, I can't expect you with me to read my mind to know how I'm feeling. Because sometimes I may not always, it may not always be physical where you can actually see in my face that, you know what, Tanya's having a bad day. It could just really be mental. And even then, because I've gotten to the point where I can have, be having a bad mental health day, but you would never know because I would laugh the same. I'll I'll text you the same. I'll I'll do everything the same because I'm trying to suppress that feeling because I don't want to have to essentially burden a person or I don't feel like even having that conversation. But again, effective communication because it's going to be key. And if you are a support person, you want to you want to be able to listen to our concerns. Because too many times, I remember in school, I forgot what it is they say, there's a difference between listening and hearing. Mm-hmm. There's, a, there's a big difference. So too many times we are listening what somebody's saying, but we're not hearing what they're saying. And then that's where the breakdown of communication, the breakdown of support can um can come about. Because again, we have to be able to listen to our concerns so that we can also, like you would say, validate our feelings. You understand what yeah. I'm saying? Validate our experiences. You know, we can, if you have someone who maybe having other health issues, accompany them to their appointment. Something as simple as that. It may not, it may not seem that it's important to us, but just simply accompanying me to my appointment, if you can, because of course, you know, we work, schedules can be messed up. But even if you're not able to accompany me, show interest, ask me questions. At least for me, that's what I would like. You know, ask me questions about how are you feeling today? I saw something before we started to record. Someone said something as simple as, can I bring you coffee or tea? Mm. You know, I'm a tea girl. You know, can I give you some coffee? If you see I'm working late or, you know, whatever it is, some nice gesture to show me that you are in tune with what I'm doing, you know, provide that emotional support. That's a big one, Whitney. That's a, that's yeah. a big, big one when it comes to our emotional support. You know, when we have that encouragement, 
and I say from our partners, but just from our friends. Because for me, I have friends that I categorize them. Like my, my support system is categorized into who I know I can call on right away when something happens. Who I know, mm. you know, may have the capacity to deal with me about something. Else. And, you know, it, it has to be that way because for me, I had to learn the harder that we can't expect our friends, family, supporters to show up for us 100% all the time. Or like I often say, I'm not going to find a me in somebody else. Mm-mm. You're not gonna. You're not gonna find a you in the way how you may show up for someone. It's yeah, not gonna yeah. be how someone shows up for you. And that I battle with that. I'm like, you know what? I'm here. I'm putting you as a priority. I'm doing X, Y, Z. The job, the partner, the support, whatever you are. But realizing that we have to meet people where they are, accept and acknowledge, because it's a two way street. I can't. I can't expect support from an individual if I'm not advocating or I'm not expressing why I need your support or this is how I need you to show up for me. And right. that was a big that was a big one for me. After coming in different relationships and in whatever it is, I just realized that I never really told this person or my manager, my friend, whatever, that this is how I want you to show up for me. So I just want to call you and talk. I don't want no advice. Just listen. So now you just need to listen here. Again, I want you to just follow me to my apartment. Don't ask me what's going on. Just I'm gonna come at you, I'm gonna hold your hand because you need that physical support. It's gonna mean a lot. So I think when it comes to supporting again listening and i want to talk about advocating really quickly and i'll share yeah. a story because my sister for almost 14 years ago which is crazy she had my first niece and i always tell this story this is how i became a dual on xyz and she lives in canada but she came to visit me when i was living in new jersey at the time and you know she was pregnant with my first niece and we went to the malls one of the biggest malls in new jersey at the time and we were walking all like you can go to that mall at eight o'clock i mean like you can spend a whole shift in that mall and she just said something random about, oh, I haven't felt the baby kick today. And let me let me just tell you guys how naive I was. And I was young, so don't judge. But I said to her, I said, oh, the baby's probably tired because we've been walking all day. No, that was one of the most <laughs> dumbest thing. Again, I was like 18, 19, but still, I mean, I was still, you know. <sighs> and I was like, you know what? Again, trying to be an antique. We, we become the different excuses for why something is not the way it is. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah, she's probably just tired because we've been walking all day. I said, maybe she was kicking when we were walking. We just didn't feel it, right? We got to the apartment and she said, no, something is strange. Like, you know, again, baby's not moving. So we call up my mom who was back home in Antigua and she's like, you know, this is not normal. You need to go to the hospital ASAP because it shouldn't be that way. So, you know, I called my uncle. We went to the hospital and of course she's pregnant. So, you know, priority to labor and delivery. And she started leaking XYZ fluids. Man, she was 21 weeks pregnant. So we know a baby, uh, the, ch- the likelihood of a baby surviving at 20 weeks is it's very, 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 very slim. And I remember you know, going to the room after they had got her checked in and the doctors came in and they were all male, one of them, you know, and they were like, you know, well, you have the 50-50 chance of the baby surviving. So we're thinking we should terminate. I kid you not. But let me tell you. you At know, 50-50? That could, okay. That could be a whole different podcast because every time I think about it, I get so upset. They said we have a 50-50% chance of the baby surviving. But you're telling my sister that we should go with the termination just because you think again 50 50 not 100 percent. now you know it's not going to survive 50 50 we have a chance and i remember a good seeing, chance. yeah i remember seeing the look on my sister's face with me because again you're going you're already traumatized from like okay what's going on with my body my baby xyz and you're telling me i got a 50 50 chance but let's just terminate because you know what whatever and the, the confused face, I wish I could be able to put it into work because I still can't 14 years later. And I was like, you know what, me, she's five years old, let me, but I'm always the big, the, the younger, you know, the bigger, younger, older sister, whatever. And I said, well, you know, first of all, we, we, we are faith-based people here. If we got a 50% chance, we're going to go with a 50%. And then let us choose what we want to do. And then if it doesn't work out, then that's on us. And they were looking at me. I said, yes. And they're like, who are you? I said, I'm her sister. Because one thing about me, I don't play when it comes to my sister. So then in that moment, I didn't realize that I was advocating for her then. Mm. right so i said that to say because I mean, long story short my, my niece she's still here she's alive she's about to be 14 in may but again you know she spent her first year in the NICU. but again that point i think in that moment i realized you know what i am an advocate i don't have to be so i think my idea or definition of being an advocate was you had to be a professional you had to have a phd you had to have whatever mm. degrees or experience so something as simple as that so if you are a friend sister co-worker whatever and you have a friend who is going through something Type related or it could just it doesn't matter what it is listen to when they're talking so you have the information so you can advocate on their behalf in the moments when they're in distress at least you know they can be you can be that trust and trusted individual to communicate their needs to someone else and it's why you know as a dual i often tell my clients you know i'm not here to speak for you 
but I can advocate for you. I'm going to make sure you have the education or the information so you can make your informed decision. But I'm just here to guide you and, of course, to be your advocate. Because too many times, especially as black women, for me, I'll use me as an example. Like I mentioned throughout the entire episode, my migraines, my GI issues. For the last two years, I've been trying to get an MRI. Haven't. I've been trying to get different tests done to see what is causing my migraine because, you know, it, it, it moved from mild to now severe. There's just, there's no in between to me. Mm. Once a migraine comes on, that's it. I'm done. And they keep telling me, oh, I'm going to put you in this medication. I'm going to put you in that medication. And I'm like, okay. At the time, because I was so desperate to be, and this is a lesson. I don't want you to be desperate when it comes to your health, but because I was so desperate for relief, I decided to take these pain medication, but I'm like, I'm too young to be on these medication granted again depending on what the issue is in your life you know whatever your illness is of course you may have to be on medications for the rest of your life but i'm thinking when i'm home in antigua my migraines aren't severe i don't even have a migraine at all that's not to say you know i'm like you know what oh, wow. yeah when, whenever i leave whenever i travel anywhere i'm not experiencing a migraine unless it's induced mm. by myself so I'm thinking, you know, I went to see a holistic practitioner because at this point, the medical doctors aren't really listening to me. You're just telling me, oh, take this medication. Oh, you're stressed because, you know, you're working full time, you're in grad school. I'm like, I've always been stressed. I've always been a student. So at this point, it has to be something else. And I went to a holistic practitioner. She told me, you know, try cooking your food with like distilled water instead of using the water from the tap. Like she was giving me different alternatives, which I have. Mm -hmm. And I have still an improvement, but again, it's not a cure, right? And I remember having... And I always tell people, when you go to the doctor, have your list of questions. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Because we know the patient provided that timing when it comes to a doctor's appointment is not more than an hour. You, you probably wait an hour in the waiting room. And then when you get behind, you're talking to your doctor or nurse practitioner for like 20, 20 minute stops. <clears throat> Excuse me, right? So you have to be able to know about your body, know what you're, what you're needing, and speak up for what you're needing. Because for me, it wasn't until I'm like, you know what, okay, here we are now. I'm sick and tired. Like I had to get real Antigua on my. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get real Antigua on my doctor because I'm like, okay, we've been doing this for a year and a half now. There's no change. Whatever medication you've been giving me, it works for at least a month, and then after that, I'm back to suffering. I cannot continue. I have a life to live. I have things to accomplish, and it wasn't until I actually like became more assertive. All of a sudden, I'm getting all these tests done. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. You know, I'm like, mm. you know what? Again. Like I did an episode about health screenings we should be making time for. Because sometimes we're just going to a primary care provider. They're doing some blood work. Oh, everything is fine. Or maybe your cholesterol is high. And that's all they're telling you. They're not telling you about lifestyle changes. They're not telling you about checking your thyroids. They're not telling you about, you know, doing a liver panel. They're not telling you about these things. So it's important for us as individuals, male or female. We have to start learning about our bodies. Get a, get a, you talk about the journal, get a, a healthcare journal. That's what mm -hmm. I do. I have to document every time I get a headache what time what probably may have caused the headache because my, my migraines are not about not come they don't they're not caused by any aura it just whenever it feels like coming mm. so i always recommend to even my friend let's keep a little book could be a small book doesn't have to be a big book and write down whenever you feel some type of way it doesn't matter if it's a pain in your finger with me on this day i had a pain in my finger it lasted for on a scale of one to ten it was a good seven because again we're living in a society right now as black women, especially in the United States, we know our pain tolerance. Oh, you know, black people don't feel pain. Mm -hmm. We got thicker skin. We got, and I was just told that like, yesterday, oh, your skin is tough. But you know what? I didn't want to be, I was like, okay, thanks <laughs> for letting me know. Like I literally got that like, yesterday, but I had to be patient. Tanya, not really like the public health Tanya, because I'm like, okay, I know that, but let's not do that. But anyway, but again, we have to really speak up for ourselves. That's why again, that who, whoever is a part of our village, Whitney, I'm not, again, you categorize how your village is, but there should be at least two to three individuals that you can trust essentially mm. to give certain information to, because when you're not in the position to even advocate for yourself, they can do it for you. Because we know when it comes to healthcare here, we as black women, I'm just going to say, we are often taken advantage of. We're not always heard. Case not me. I'm an example. I had to literally get overly assertive in order for me to get certain tests ran on me. Because what they didn't think they was, oh you know what it's just you you're stressed out or then they would they would ask me questions about oh what about your income I said we're not talking about that that should not like I remember the first time she asked me that question and like, it doesn't matter what my income is we already know again some people were living in poverty or living check to check whatever it is it doesn't matter what the circumstances is run every right. test treat me with the respect that I so deserve, not because of the color of my skin. So it's very important. Again, I used to be a person, I was scared to advocate for myself. I was scared to speak up to my provider because I didn't want to be that person. Because again, 
you know, you got to deal with racism, especially if they aren't people of color either. I'll say that. For me, especially if they're not people of color, I often feel like I have to perform yeah. for my doctor. Yep. So there have been, been many times I've been to appointments with me when I'm, I have questions that I wanted to ask, but I'm like, you know, let me just sit here and just let them do whatever and tell me whatever and keep it moving. And I said, no, I, I can't do it anymore. So if you never take away anything from what I say today, speak up for yourself, have that list of questions that you need to ask, whether it's your therapist, your chiropractor, it doesn't matter who it is have that conversation because that we that we've seen a lot when it comes to patient provider care that the time spent with your care provider is very limited. What can I do in 20 minutes? I can spend 20 minutes telling you how I am today. Yeah. Before before even getting to why I'm here, you know? Okay. So yeah. it's it's very important as a, for an individual to advocate for themselves but have that support system that can do it on your behalf because you could you could be someone who maybe you know shy or you're not as assertive as some of us could be. So you definitely want to have someone who can support you. It's very important. Again, that listening and hearing aspect of, of life, it's, 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 it's very important. Mm. I know I said a lot because mm. now I'll be talking. I can talk yeah, about it. No, I no, it's good. <laughs> um, my last question is, share with us what the mantra or affirmation that you are relying on in this season of your life is. Whew, yeah, that's a very good question, especially today. I, I, I've been living by this mantra. I'm, I'm going to give you two. One okay. is perseverance is key. Because when, I, when I've been through so many life experiences and I felt like giving up for some reason, I don't know what that, what that word is, it's just like perseverance is key. Your resilience. So you just got to keep persevere. Like we mentioned in the episode, you got to restructure your model as to how you're going to go about your life. So perseverance is key. But my biggest, my main one is nothing happens before it's time. Mm. Because I think about where I am now in my life and where I was. Like when, even when I failed out of nursing school, I thought my life was over. And I had to pivot and then I found public health and became overly in love with the field of public health. And I just remember that the me now is talking to you today and the me from five years ago, had I not been through what I've been through, then I would not have been ready to walk into the life or live the life that I'm having right now. So it's just like nothing happened before it's sad. So whenever I get sad, I'm like, wow, you know, you're 33, now in grad school, you should have been done grad school. You know, I, cause I do it all the time. I'm like, you know what? No, had I been to grad school a couple of years ago, I would not have been ready. To face it, right? No. So yeah. my my biggest mantra is nothing happens before it's time. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. And so, where can people find you? How can we listen to T with Tanya podcast? Yes, find T with Tanya podcast on Spotify. What is it? Apple Podcast. Wherever you get your podcast, you can find it there. And you can find me at T with Tanya podcast. And if you want to support Scrub Life Kids, we're on Scrub Life Kids on every platform: Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. You know, donate or just if you have any suggestions, just let me know. And I'm happy that I'm on Impost Rates podcast. You are amazing, Whitney. You know how I feel about you. I call her my sister. She's my, she's my <laughs> sister. She's my queen. So I'm happy to be here and I'm very, very proud of you as well, too. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, y'all. Thanks for tuning in with Two Impostrix Podcast today. Be validated. Yes.